You ever send an email and you forget to attach a file that you referenced in the email? Well, here's an interesting thing. In the first series of letters between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, after they had a big falling out, and now they're writing letters to each other for the first time in 11 years, an 18th century version of that failure to attach the file happens. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I pronounce you will love him if you ever become acquainted with him. So wrote Thomas Jefferson to his friend James Madison about John Adams. As two diplomats of the fledging United States, the two often saw each other. The families were close. Jefferson was a frequent visitor in Paris. Jefferson's daughter Polly actually stayed with the Adamses in London the two had met in the Continental Congress. During the battle over independence, John Adams was on the lookout for Virginians that he felt could lead the fight, rather than distasteful New Englanders like himself. We're the New England Puritans, we're obnoxious and all of that. The Virginians feel just as strongly about independence, so make Washington the general. And for writing the Declaration of Independence, no one has a more masterly pen than the author of The Rights of British North Americans, famous pamphlet that went far and wide, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson felt as well about Adams that he had a sound mind. Their friendship continues through the Revolution, through the period that they're both diplomats, and they're carrying on a great correspondence about a variety of topics. When John Adams is selected as vice president in 1788, he gets a letter of congratulations from his good friend, Tom Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson doesn't know at this time that he's going to be called back from Paris to become the first Secretary of State of the United States. So he's going to get involved in the administration that, as Vice President John Adams is nominally a member of, but there begins to develop cracks at least between Jefferson and the administration that he's part of, President George Washington and his Lieutenant Alexander Hamilton. Jefferson takes issue with the banking policy, the strong federal government, the selling of the debt of the revolution. This doesn't put him in direct conflict with Adams, but there are minor cracks. The first crack is when Tom Paine, famous author of Common Sense, has written his book, The Rights of Man, 1791. And Jefferson gets a copy, and he writes very good things back to the person that sent it to him. And this somehow gets in the hands of the printer. The printer's like, well, Thomas Jefferson has endorsed this book. I'm going to include these comments. But what Jefferson says is, this book is good. It will be an antidote to the heresies that have sprung up among us. Well, John Adams had just written a book, and in his book, he talked about the British system and extolled its virtues. Jefferson's comments coming at this time were probably aimed at that book and at anyone who would start to try to develop a monarchy in the United States, something that Jefferson was very much afraid of, and something that Adams thought was hyperventilating. Almost everyone knows that the comments are about Adams, but it's made worse by the fact that there is a defender of Jefferson and a defender of Adams going at it in the newspapers. And some people are saying, this could be Jefferson, this could be Adam, writing under the names Publicola and Agricola and arguing about whether Adams is a monarchist or not. Eventually, Jefferson decides to write a letter to Adams saying, I have never put anything in the newspapers that does not contain my name. And he apologizes if any comments were construed of being about him. They certainly weren't. And Adams writes back, 
It was high time that you and I should come to an explanation with each other. Your friendship has been very dear to my heart. And in effect, Adams accepts his apology, though one can understand that he probably did think the comments were about him. Jefferson ends up retiring as Secretary of State. They're still writing letters. In fact, Adams says, I really envy you getting to go back to your country house. Jefferson and Adams trade letters when it comes to an issue of great importance, the English and French War of 1793. Jefferson writes, I confess to you I have seen enough of war never to wish to see another. And Adams writes back, another war would add two or three hundred millions to our debt. Even in 1796, when ostensibly it's Jefferson versus Adams in the presidential election of that year, but it's not like it is today. There's no party conventions and no one's going across the country barnstorming and the like. Adams receives the votes to become president. Jefferson's elected vice president. Jefferson pens a letter of congratulations. Now, there's a problem with this. The letter's very nice. It's, you're my senior anyway. I would expect you to, to win. You've always been my senior in politics. I never really sought to govern men anyway. Jefferson has second thoughts, because maybe in the future, he does want to get into politics, and a line like that might be used against him. So he sends it to James Madison first. James Madison decides, too much politics going on here, let's not send the letter to Adams. So a chance to kind of give a nice congratulations there by letter was missed. Probably something verbally happened, because we do know when John Adams is sworn in, Jefferson is there fulfilling his role as the elected vice president. But the vice presidency does not have a lot of defined powers, and... Some people are saying, this is great. They see John Adams and Thomas Jefferson in a, in a hotel talking together. This looks really good for the Republic. And there's some talk that maybe Adams will consult more with Jefferson. Adams suggests that maybe Jefferson could go on a mission to France. Well, neither side likes that because from Jefferson's point of view, first of all, he has, I don't know if it's constitutional that the vice president could do something like that. And also, I'm, I'm not sure why he wants to send me away. And on the other hand, it's like Federalists are thinking, do you really want to give your political opponent or a name like Jefferson a victory like that? Or put him in charge where he could do mischief? Both think enough of it to not really want to go forward. There's a, there's a moment where chance encounter on the street corner, Fifth and Market, Jefferson after that, Jefferson says, I really didn't consult with him about matters of importance after that. So there's no doubt that this is where our famous story of politics getting in the way of a perfectly good friendship starts. <laughs> because if you look at just the trail of correspondence, the letters back and forth between them, which stops. And in 1800, there's going to be a nasty election. Adams is voted out. Jefferson eventually is voted in. There's one letter that essentially says, you know, I have these horses here in the president's stable, and they belong to the country, not to me, so you can have them. And that's it. And a decade's going to pass. So is this the first instance of unfriending over politics? <laughs> I doubt it. Correspondence in these days had certain rules. You know, you didn't always just write to someone. Usually you needed a letter of introduction. You didn't always just visit a person. And obviously if someone didn't like someone's company, there were customs and rules that would allow them to avoid I often talk on this program about historical events on two planes. One would be issues of politics. What should we do? What's the history of thinking about what we should do? Then I often get into the politics of 
who's doing what. The real politic, the strategy, the campaigns, the stuff that's on CNN all the time, right? What's the history of that? Who did what to whom? Who was the first to use this strategy, etc.? Well, what I don't often get into, almost ever, is the ethos of what you should do. You, as individuals, should do. But I think this topic brings up that for me. Because I observe what is out there, and I see that there is a trend that goes beyond just the political actors, the Hillary, the Trump, and all of that. And now on to supporters, who play a big role. The proliferation of social media has absolutely increased the voice that average people have. No doubt. I mean, there's many good aspects to this. When you think about, in total, how much more political voice there is out there now, how many more people are being heard than, say, in the 70s or 90s even, I mean, a low-wage worker, say, in 1980, they didn't have a union. They probably had very little voice if they wanted to express how they felt about politics or time to do it. Now they likely have a smartphone. Not all, but likely. They can communicate, organize with others. They can express opinions to their politicians through the medium. Everywhere is a tavern house or a coffee house of old. That might not have been the case in the past. You would have had mechanics, artisans, even a lot of busy merchants, too busy to really get into politics, and only certain individuals participated in this. This has all changed. On one hand, you can obtain fairly quickly from Twitter feeds or comments what the other side to a story is. You can just see the reaction to almost everything now. You see a news story and you look to the comments. I mean... So in a way, you're getting more depth of information. But the new social media is also sending headlines around more frequently. So not just from a few sources, but from your friends. And not all people investigate and read, even to do as little as to read what the story is or what its main proof is. The headlines themselves become truth. I'm loath to use the term fake news because it's already getting overused and already being backlashed. Or, well, fake news goes back. I mean, uh, you can look at the complaints that George Washington had. There's actually a very good book out right now. John Avalon of the Daily Beast has written a book about Washington's farewell address. And Washington is continuously complaining about really what was the fake news of his time. You know, people saying that he was stealing money like a common thief, being senile and not in charge of his government, playing the fiddle like Nero and, and the like. He writes his farewell address because he wants to set the nation a good course towards the end of his presidency. He does give it to Alexander Hamilton to edit. And one of the things that Hamilton says you got to take out is Washington's got this large passage in there about taking on his critics. You know, I really shouldn't respond, he says, to this, but I'm going to respond to some of the attacks that have been made against me. And Hamilton successfully convinces him, no, indeed, in this, you must speak to universal truths and not respond to a few comments that were made about you. But that was all about false news. Washington wasn't stealing any money, and he was very much in control of things. But the proliferation of, of newspapers at the time, well, there were, there were, in, in the major cities in America, there were many, you know, scores of newspapers that someone could read, led to the, some unscrupulous printing going on to sell papers and also to advance party agendas. And most major factions or parties had a newspaper supporting them. Jefferson had James Callender on the payroll. He was uh, working technically to print things for the State Department, but also was printing his Gazette. I expressed the Republican viewpoint. Later, Callender turns against Jefferson, and he gets kind of a taste of his own medicine. 
But there's no doubt that if we're to look at, at what happened in 2016 and how how fierce this election was, how visceral the election was, and to the topic that I'm talking about today, how many people have unfollowed? I'm, I'm sure of it that you listening have unfollowed people or blocked people. And you might have unfriended people who were in your Facebook feed who otherwise um, would talk to if it didn't come to the issue of politics. What occurred? Well, if you compare the smartphone to the growth of radio, say, in the 19-teens, there were a few thousand radio kits, very little to speak of. By 1924, there were 2.5 million in the United States. And so radio is becoming a factor. And indeed, in 1924 and 1928, it already has impact. In 1924, the radio broadcast of the 109 ballot Democratic convention makes the party looks like a bunch of buffoons and really leads to the downfall in that election. Helps Coolidge. 1928, Al Smith's accent, being a New Yorker and really talking that way, doesn't go over well in the rest of the country when they're listening on radio. Very similar thing happens here, if you ask me. You go back just to 2012, there was something like 80 million smartphones, and in 2008, even less. Now, more than double that. 2006, Twitter is invented. Reporters start to like it. By 2016... You have a candidate who I think almost all would acknowledge boosted his campaign by Twitter. The smartphone increased as well the personal nature of politics by involving more people in politics, in discussions with each other, in an instantaneous form of communication. New people are not only in your living room, but traveling with you at all times, debating each point. And so I see in this election, you know, there was also more variations and factions that didn't like each other, even crossing over parties. So you had the never Trumpers versus the Trump supporters, Bernie versus Hillary, Libertarians, Greens. You're you're just hearing a little more from them than you normally would when the only way they could get their message out was like an 800 number C-SPAN. I've heard this more than a few times. Democrats who said that they blocked more Hillary people or more Bernie people than they did with Trump people. The attack hurts more sometimes when it's in your own party. So all of this, this new but old trend of unfriending, unfollowing, ending correspondence, not talking, just seems appropriate to tell the classic story of American politics. But as usual, I think... It's not always told in the right way, and I'll get into it. I think there's a few factors that people don't know about the Jefferson and Adams letters that enrich the story. So where we last left off, Jefferson is president. He continues his presidential term with nary a letter between Adams and Jefferson. Now, there's a part of the story that occurs that's not well known. And that is that Jefferson exchanges letters with another Adams, not John Adams, but Abigail Adams. And this occurs in 1804. And there's a reason for this. Adams learns, Abigail Adams learns, that Jefferson's daughter Polly has died. Polly's now an adult, but as a child... Abigail Adams remembers receiving the child over in Europe and has a dilemma. She doesn't like Jefferson for what he's done politically, for what she feels he's done to her husband. But she just can't reckon that with the fact that he must be suffering so much. So here's what he writes. Here's what she writes, you know, that I several times I picked up the pen and put it down. But my heart compelled me to write to you, is what she says. And she's thinking about the death of her own son, Charles Adams. 
I have tasted the bitter cup and bow with reverence and humility before the great dispenser of it, without whose permission not a sparrow falls to the ground. That you may derive comfort is the sincere wish of her who once took pleasure in being your friend, Abigail Adams. Well, now, I think you'll notice something, and Jefferson notices something when he gets the letter and reads it, and that is that she's using a past tense, <laughs> one who used to be your friend. So he responds immediately, you know, of course, passing on, um, thank you for this letter. Mentions that his daughter Polly was always asking about her and the family. It was one of the first inquiries that she would make. But he goes on. He doesn't just stop at, thanks for your nice letter about my daughter. He says, one thing, I, I've never thought badly of your husband, but there's only one thing that he did that gave me any kind of regret, and that was that he appointed all of these people to positions in midnight hour before I could take office, and these people were, were opposed to me. Abigail writes back, indicating that's a silly point. My husband was the president of the United States. As far as I'm concerned, as far as I read and know, it's the president's job to appoint people and not leave positions vacant um, so that the government would have empty offices. She mentions that Washington before Adams had filled those positions. Constitution says it's the president's power to do it. She then says, there's two things that gave offense to me that you did. And one is that you hired this calendar person to write bad things about my husband and spread lies. And even though I'm aware that he turned against you, that's just you getting a bite of the snake that you let out. The Adamses, both John and Abigail, were not, I don't want to say they weren't believers in free speech, but if you, in regards to this whole discussion we have today about the fake news, I think it's interesting because I do believe they would be on the side of restraining that a bit. They did believe in freedom of speech and freedom of the press, but they also thought that a lot of what being, was being published was libelous. Also, she says, John Quincy Adams was pulled from a federal position in Massachusetts and replaced with someone who supported Jefferson. So she gives her grievances. Jefferson ends up writing a letter back with kind of some explanation for both. The breach is never quite repaired. In fact, in the, the final letter between them, Abigail has shown this to John Adams, and John Adams just writes a note for history. I have reviewed everything here, and I have no comment on it. So between the time of the freeze-out and the thaw between Jefferson and Adams, there is this little quick event that I, I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of. What happens to repair the relationship between Jefferson and Adams? It's in 1811, and by now Jefferson is out of office. Madison is into his first term as president. And Edward Coles, who is Madison's, the president's secretary, Coles and his brother, who are good friends also with Jefferson, travel to New England, and they go to see people there. One of them is Adams. They get to talking, and Jefferson's name comes up, and they find that Adams had great respect, contempt, actually, for newspapers that were attacking Jefferson. Adams says to Coles, I've always loved Jefferson. Coles relays this to Jefferson when he gets back to Virginia, and Jefferson is pleased. I always knew him to be an honest man, Jefferson says. At the same time, their mutual friend, Benjamin Rush, has been trying to get the two together, I mean, to the point that he tells John Adams, you know, I had a dream that two great founders of our country who had stopped talking got together again and, and back and forth and so on. I think that what's going on is neither one wants to write the letter just at Benjamin Rush's behest. 
So it's kind of the combo of Rush and Coles in 1811 that happens that triggers something here. John Adams finally says to Rush, I think you've been saying the same thing to Jefferson as well. So I think you're kind of teasing us. And then he says, you know, where there has been no war, there can be no negotiation for peace. In other words, we're not fighting. We're not really not talking. There's just been no reason to write a letter to Jefferson and no reason for he to write a letter to me. You know, that kind of thing. But having answered that way, it's John Adams who takes the first step. Uh, the first letter in 1811 is interesting because John Adams writes the first thing you know, in the letter, I, you're going to find attached some homespun, you know, which we would normally refer to as homegrown clothing, like clothing you would make in a spinning jenny at home or something like that. And I hope you'll find it to your liking. A few commentaries on a few things. Jefferson gets the letter. And then writes back, I'm sorry, you know, I, I got the letter, but there's no homespun. I, I didn't get the homespun. It must have been lost in the mails or something like that. The reality is that it's not homespun. It's not an article of clothing. Because a few days later, Jefferson has to write another letter when he discovers that the homespun is actually a book on politics and policy written by John Quincy Adams that John Adams, his father, and also an author of many books, is very proud of. So Jefferson, of course, writes a letter. Oh, I see my mistake now, and I see the kind of joke that you were making. From 1811 to 1826, they'll begin a correspondence, and they talk of all kinds of things, events of the day, their memories of the Revolution, about acquaintances. Is this person alive or dead? You have to remember letters and correspondence are, are their way of getting news in these, you know, have you read this book? They're asking about the other signers, and it's interesting reading the letters as one signer after another passes away until eventually Jefferson and Adams will in 1826, being noted by them. Oh, I'm going to introduce you to this person. They're coming to Virginia. Oh, would you receive this person? They're coming to New England. They talk about Socrates, Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Moses, the Hindu religion, Oriental religions, Cicero. Who could write the history of the American Revolution? They conclude no one can. No one can. The War of 1812 hits, and they're discussing that. Adams complains about Tom Paine. Jefferson complains about Hamilton, you know, long dead by the time they're writing these letters. Adams writes, do you remember if you were the first person in the administration to advocate for a Navy? I think you were. So I think there's a couple things to note about the Jefferson-Adams letters. And one is that Adams writes a lot more than Jefferson does. I think he's verbose. I think it's faster. I think he's more of a talker. I think that's a personality. He's a New Englander, Northerner. I think Jefferson is slower, calmer. He writes generally shorter letters. He apologizes constantly. Once in a while, he tries to catch up with a really big letter with a lot of things in it. Uh, it's very common for Adams to write two or three letters before he gets one back. I think Jefferson has more people writing him. He bemoans the duty of letter writing, that he's kind of attached to a table indoors. Jefferson has set up in Monticello in his cabinet. He's got a desk. He's got his chair. And he, and he also has a place to put his legs up, especially as he got older while he's writing. He uses a device, a polygraph, which will actually allow him to write two letters at the same time. In other words, to write a copy of the letter. It's just basically like a mechanical arm with a pen in it. And it looks and functions like the polygraph that detects lies, except it's not detecting him lying. It's just copying the letter. And it, it gives him a copy as a massive filing system. He's very neat, very organized. Correspondence is a duty he has to keep up with. And with his hurt wrist, he had fell in France, hurt his wrist. And that continues to hurt him throughout his life. And it's kind of a painful duty, too. So as not to offend anyone, correspondence must be responded to. Jefferson does more, I believe, than Adams during the time that they're writing letters. He spends about two to three hours on horseback each day. 
also owns another property that he keeps referencing, and it's one of the reasons he can't get back to Adams all the time. And he's starting the University of Virginia, which is his project late in life. Jefferson's busier. Adams has more to say. I'd also say that this is spun sometimes through history as two partisans who were bitter opponents and came back together. And I think that that has to be clarified more. It's not as if, and this wouldn't be possible since Hamilton died, it's not as if Jefferson and Hamilton came back together late in life and started writing letters to each other and then died on the same day. John Adams was not clearly a partisan. Tended more towards those that would be considered Federalists. He did not call himself any member of a party or a faction. He tried to avoid it. He had just as many squabbles with Hamilton sometimes as Jefferson did. So it's not as clear a case of a partisan battle between two bitter opponents than it was kind of two people who participated in the politics of their day and never really did lose respect for each other weren't the two leading opponents of their policy. See, Hamilton was, his his hands were directly involved in politics, in trying to get people elected, and trying to get policies through. Adams was doing a job. To the extent that there was a political difference between them, I'm not sure it was entirely changed by the letters. I don't think, for instance, Jefferson, although he starts out saying, I could care less about politics. And Adams makes some similar statements like, you'd be amazed that now I'm not just reading about politics and policy, I'm also reading about religion. And nevertheless, I think they're both pretty much in their same places politically. Although he says he doesn't read the newspapers anymore, his letters to other people, for instance, there's a letter in 1816 to William Branch Giles where he's still talking about that you know, the federal, the federal government's centralizing power and people want to usurp the states. And he's advocating a Republican, Democratic direction for the country. I'm going to read a little bit from the letters. On the Premium Podcast, again, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com, I'll actually have a cast there where I'm going to read more. It's not up yet, but it will be coming, where we're going to look at more of of the letters, because there's a lot of variety between them. A lot of people think like all they did was talk about the revolution or politics or, or great issues of state, and that's not really true. In fact, that's the least of what they discuss. Jefferson to Adams, where get we the Ten Commandments? The book indeed gives it to us, us verbatim, but where did we get them? For itself tells us They were written by the finger of God on tablets of stone, which were destroyed by Moses. It specifies those in the second set of tables, different form and substance, but still without saying how the others were recovered. Adams to Jefferson, you suppose a difference of opinion between you and me on the subject of aristocracy. I can find none. I dislike and detest hereditary honors. Jefferson to Adams, 1816. Your two philosophical letters have been too long in my carton of letters to be answered. To the question, indeed, on the utility of grief, no answer remains to be given. You have exhausted the subject. I see that, with the other evils in life, it is destined to temper the cup we are to drink. John Adams I am not weary of writing. I am sure you must be of reading such incoherent rattle. I will not persecute you so severely in the future, if I can help it. So, farewell. But will you say our elections are pure? Be it so, upon the whole. But do you recollect in history a more corrupt election than that of Aaron Burr to be president, or that of DeWitt Clinton last year? By corruption here I mean a sacrifice of every national interest and honor to private and party objects. Jefferson to Adams. The passage you quote from Theogonus, I think, has an ethical rather than a political object. The whole piece is a moral exhortation. John Adams, 1816. I cannot be serious. I am about to write to you the most frivolous letter you will ever read. Would you go back to your cradle and live over again your 70 years? I believe you would return me a New England answer by asking me another question. Would you live your 80 years over again? If I am prepared to give you an explicit answer, the question involves so many considerations of metaphysics and physics and theology and ethics of 
philosophy and history, of experience and romance, of tragedy, comedy, and farce, that I would not give my opinion without writing a volume to justify it. Jefferson Adams, 1816. You ask me if I would agree to live my 70 or rather 73 years over again, to which I say yea. I think with you that it is a good world on the whole, that it has been framed on principal benevolence, and more pleasure than pain dealt out to us. There are indeed, who might say nay, gloomy and hypochondriac minds, inhabitants of diseased bodies, disgusted with the present and despairing of the future, always counting that the worst will happen, because it may happen. To these I say, how much pain have cost us the evils which have never happened. I steer my bark with hope in the head, leaving fear astern. These letters go on and on. I think it's useful to look at the, the rest of, of history. You're getting 50 years from the Declaration of Independence that they both participated in making. You're getting several presidents from Madison being president, James Monroe being president, both getting two terms, and finally John Quincy Adams becoming president, and just in his final year is when they need to stop writing. By the 1820s, you start to see in their letters little references, Adams comparing himself to an aging author. Jefferson talks about his crippled wrists. In 1826, in January, Adams writes Jefferson that, I am certainly near the end of my life. The last letter, because as we know, both will die on July 4th, 1826. The last letter that we have is April 17th, and it is from Adams to Jefferson. Telling Jefferson that Jefferson's grandson, Jefferson Randolph, has just visited John Adams in Massachusetts, and he cracks a joke. How is it that you Virginians are all Joshua's? meaning really tall. Here's what someone said uh, on Quora recently. I just went no contact on my son for posting anti-Hillary propaganda. Am I overreacting? I, well, I would say if you're not talking to your own son at all in any way, I'd rethink that. If I assume the most logical that this non-contact is about social media non-contact, I'd remember this. A friend on Facebook is only what Mark Zuckerberg decided to call an element of a software program. A follow on Twitter or Instagram is a software selection that you'd like to tell the software that you want to see a person's post on a multi-daily basis. Just as people in the 1950s and 1960s probably should have been more careful about Coca-Cola being not an energy drink, as some of the ads showed, but as a sugar injection. We are really getting bamboozled in the same way that we have friends on Facebook and Twitter to the point that unfriending or unfollowing someone is breaking off a friendship. It's simply, I don't want to see this on my feed. Or better, you haven't indicated to me that you're producing substantiated content that informs me or entertains me for that matter. Or just simply... This is making me fatigued, angry. It's making me think of arguments against this meme when I wanted to look at my friend's pictures, their baby pictures or cats. I don't have time to be in political sparring mode, and I don't need to be angry every time I pick up my phone. So yes, even a family member, even a son could fall into that category. Another common assertion that I, that I hear quite often and erroneously all over the internet is that freedom of speech means your view must be heard. Not true. The speaker gets their freedom when they speaketh. They get their chance at the soapbox. They can spill out junk. And you leave the soapbox. You're going to other soapboxes, no doubt. No one is pressing an app to have the police arrest your son for anti-Hillary propaganda. Historically speaking, the only reason there isn't a freedom to read or a freedom to not read, a freedom to listen or a freedom to not listen, is that the one implies, suggests the other. Freedom of the press is to create materials to read, more viewpoints, and to have more to read and listen for more choices. The foundation of a right to speech is that there'll be more to listen to 
implying a right to listen. And if it doesn't need to be really implied, you have the nice Ninth Amendment there. There's more rights in the Constitution than are actually expressly written down. I suppose if this were the scenario, uh, the, the, one of the reasons we don't need an expressed right to listen is that if someone forced you to listen, I'm pretty sure we could find rights that that was trampling on, even if there isn't a particular amendment with that name. If someone said, every day you must listen to 10 you know, uh, TV programs that you don't want to, read 10 posts, or see 10 pictures, or see 10 videos that you don't want to, I'm sure that would be addressed. When ABC Television asked William F. Buckley, the well-known conservative commentator and publisher of the National Review, who he wouldn't want to be on TV with, he first said, there's no one that I wouldn't talk to. Then he added, well, not Gore Vidal. Well, some television executive there decided in 1968, as the Republican and Democratic conventions are approaching and they wanted some unique political coverage, some angle on the other networks, that they would bring these two absolute opposites together. Buckley from the right, Vidal from the left. The result was a kind of television that we'd be used to now, a kind of proto Crossfire, reality TV, where the two commentators really went at it personally. But it was shocking for the time. I think more than Buckley, Vidal wanted blood. He wanted to expose Buckley, who he felt was a fraud with no ideas. And I also think that Buckley wanted to get back at him. And to sit by and watch a professional a critics of the Republican Party... Uh, burlesque uh, people whom uh, think it's right to present Mr. Gore Vidal as a political commentator of any consequence, since he is nothing more than uh, than a literary producer of uh, uh, of, of a perverted uh, Hollywood-minded prose. Now, now, Bill, I, I, I think, think this uh, time uh, for a very simple reason that, that uh, now, Bill, if I may say, just, so, just, just, I, I think ABC I think has the right. Here, Bill, just as I think not, ABC has the authority. Now, Bill, I'm yeah, no. almost through. No, you're not. In every I, sense. I, he's always to the right, I think, and almost always in the wrong. And you certainly must, uh, Bill, maintain your reputation as being the Marie Antoinette to the right wing. And they get to the Democratic conventions of that year, and that means they're commenting on the night that protesters marched on the DNC and police beat them. And it gets pretty heated. And to our two guest commentators, William Buckley and Gore Vidal, and to ask them uh, what observations they've made about the security that we uh, have seen all week at this convention and the events tonight on the streets beyond this uh, convention hall. Uh, is, who is first? Mr. Vidal first. I think uh, there's very little that we can say after those pictures. Buckley's defending the police, Vidal defending the protesters, until it reaches a point where twice Vidal calls him a Nazi. Buckley strikes back hard, and he's mad on TV. It's the exact reverse of his image that he's cultivated and that we probably know him for, if you're not aware of this incident. And I'm for ostracizing people who egg on other people to shoot American Marines and American soldiers. As I know you don't as care. As far as I know you the only sort of pro or crypto Nazi yeah. I can think of is yourself. Uh, Failing that, that's, I would only that's say that we names. can't have. Now listen, you the right yeah. Stop calling yeah. me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names. Stop you in this goddamn face. Let's, you'll stay plastered. Gentlemen, let's go. Let us go back to his pornography and stop making any illusions of Nazi. I bet you do. Infantry in the last war. You were not an infantry. As a matter of fact, I was a second right. I was a second right. You were not. You were distorting your own military record. Vidal really won. 
He felt that always that he won because he broke down the cool, calm, and collective Buckley. I should note that back in 1968, ABC had asked me and Buckley to debate each other at the Democratic and Republican conventions. Although Buckley was often drunk and out of control, he was always a spontaneous liar on any subject that his dizzy brain might extrude. It was a day that Buckley would regret deeply. He wouldn't talk about Vidal in interviews. Even in 2006, two years before his death, he wouldn't talk about Gore Vidal at all. The two never stopped fighting. Buckley would sue Gore Vidal for libel after he had published a magazine article attacking him. That suit would go on for years. Here's an article that Vidal writes after Buckley's death in 2008. Buckley maintained that I supported revolutionaries who favored murdering U.S. Marines. Yet all the talk of Nazis, etc., was started by Buckley. There is no lie he would not tell to get back at those who defeated him in debate. I'm critical of what I see, generally. I do question a bit about how our debates are structured in this politics of today. Increasingly today, debates that are consisting of people posting pictures at each other, videos at each other, links at each other. Remember, I was on one website and I was explaining a pretty complicated point about the Supreme Court and granting cert. After a few comments that I had mentioned in the discussion, the person said, do you have a link for any of this? As if the only source for the truth might be a link to some article from somewhere. That there could be no truth from someone who has a history of perhaps reading books and knowing about a topic. But I, I digress a bit. I think there's a lot of talking at each other and not talking to each other. I think there's a lot of talking and not listening. I think there's a lot of not even persuasion, but righteousness, perhaps and not looking for education in what you can learn from a discussion. I also see a very disturbing trend in that while we have great freedom of speech, and it's highly valued in the United States, and, and there, there really isn't a, a discernible problem with in terms of your speaking, and now you're going to be put in jail or anything like that. That's not our real problem. And I do question sometimes whether there is really free discussion, if not free speech. I think uh, particularly with something like social media where say the wrong thing and there'll be 700 negative comments. If we're starting to get into something beyond speech, really, the mechanisms of some of the social media apps are in discouraging discussion instead of encouraging it. I wonder about that. Could be some solutions that to develop. I think the answer is in individuals to get more opinions for themselves. I think it's it's possibly in discussion clubs or groups where there's certain discussion rules that would ensure that we're not just like posting links at each other or something. I noted this from John Stuart Mill, who would have influenced anyone who was an early American involved in government. In politics, again, it is almost a commonplace that a party of order or stability and a party of progress or reform are both necessary elements of a healthy state of political life. Until the one or the other shall have so enlarged its mental grasp to be a party equally of order and progress, knowing and distinguishing what is fit to be preserved from what ought to be swept away. Each of these modes of thinking derives its utility from the deficiencies of the other. But it is, in a great measure, the opposition of the other that keeps each within the limits of reason and sanity. Truth, in the great practical concerns of life, is so much a question of the reconciling and combining of opposites that very few have minds sufficiently capacious and impartial to make the adjustment with an approach to correctness. We have hitherto considered only two possibilities, that the received opinion may be false and some other opinion consequently true or that the received opinion being true, a conflict with the opposite era, is essential to a clear apprehension and deep feeling of its truth. But there is a commoner cause than either of these, 
when the conflicting doctrines, instead of one being true and the other false, share the truth between them. And the non-conforming opinion is needed to supply the remainder of the truth of which the received doctrine embodies only a part. Popular opinions on subjects not palpable to sense are often true, but seldom or never the whole truth. They are part of the truth, sometimes a greater, sometimes a smaller part, but exaggerated, distorted, and disjoined from the truths by which they ought to be accompanied and limited. John Stuart Mill I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We have the premium cast. It can be as low as $2 a month. Support the program. Get more episodes. Thanks for listening.